This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is Twim, This Week in Microbiology, episode 289, recorded on June 8th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here with you. You have smoke there from Canada? We do. Yeah, you're pretty close. Yeah. It's troubling. Yep. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. And no smoke. Didn't get down that far, huh? It, well, we stick further out in the Atlantic. And okay. so I think it'll eventually get here. And from St. Louis, Missouri, Petra Levin. It's good to be here. I think we just have naturally bad air quality due to pollen and other things. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, it said ozone last week, which I'm not sure that was a new air quality issue for us. But I don't think we have smoke that I can tell. Yesterday, I, I took a train from Washington, D.C., and uh, I was pulling into Metro Park, and it was all yellow outside. Yeah. I said, did they tint the windows? I didn't notice it. And I got outside. Oh, my creepy. God, it smelled, and it was totally smoky. It was like there was a local forest fire, you know, or a house fire or something. But no, it's from farther away. Today, it's uh, better. I have a colleague that was in New York for a conference, and she said the airports shut down because they didn't have proper vis visibility. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Flights were being canceled. Wow. I'm glad I wasn't flying. Mm. Uh, yeah, the trains were running. And today, it's much better. It's much better. Interesting. All right. We, <laughs> that, was, that was an interesting weather <laughs> <laughs> event. Yes. <laughs> the likes of which we usually don't have. But now it's back to microbiology. And speaking of microbiology, I just want to tell our listeners, for some time now, uh, Microbe TV has had a Discord server. A Discord server doesn't mean we're all disagreeing. No. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a place where you can go and, and uh, chat with like-minded people. So it it's a home for People who are interested in all of our podcasts, TWIV, TWIM, TWIP, et cetera. And you can go and you, you just register and then you're part of the community. And it's very cool. There are, I think, almost a thousand people there who have registered and they talk about all the different programs. So we'll put a link in the show notes to that. It's free. And um, people from all over the world are there. And you can talk about microbiology, virology, neuroscience, whatever you, you would like. To talk about it's a lot of fun. We have moderators to keep things civil as well, because <laughs> in this day and age, you need uh, moderators. <laughs> are people interacting in real time, or are they yeah. just posting in in real yeah, time? Yeah, in real time, yeah. you can post a question, and somebody, if someone's there, they will answer. You can tell who's there and who's not there. People mm -hmm. post links to papers, all the podcasts. When they are published, they automatically go there so people can reference them. Uh, but, yeah, there's often – we have some high school students <laughs> who are there asking questions of the erudite, you know. Oh, that's great. <laughs> it's really cool. It's a great – I mean, someone suggested I do this uh, over a year ago. So at the beginning of this year, I think I finally did it, and it just took off. And people volunteered to be moderators. It's really great. And there's one moderator whose uh, nickname is Peak Dunning Kruger. <laughs> it's not his real name. He's a high school student. He just got into UCLA. He's crazy about viruses. He's gonna. He's a future scientist. It'd be fun to watch his career. You know, he's gonna. Oh, that's neat. Gonna be there. All right. So today we have two papers that are very much all about bacterial defenses against phage infections. And I am going to start with a snippet, uh, which is a Nature article called Ubiquitin-like Conjugation by Bacterial Sea Gas Enhances Antiphage Defense by Justin Jensen, Tuo Li, Feng Du, Chi Kui Yi, and Zhijian Chen. 
This is from University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. And I have to say that Ji Jean Chen is a rock star in this field, does amazing biochemistry. He is the one who discovered sea gas, which I'll tell you about in a second. He's also worked out many other in eukaryotic cells, innate sensing pathways, and now he has moved into uh, bacterial systems uh, as well. Sea gas, which and we talked about his discovery uh, of sea gas on TWIV 222. Oh my gosh, this is like ancient. <laughs> what, when was that? Let me look at the date. March 2013. It's not that long ago, but the numbers just go up. Um, and the name of the, the episode was Jumpin' Jack Flash, It's a Gas, Gas, Gas. Remember that song? <laughs> Clever. G-A-S stands for, sea gas stands for cyclic GMP AMP synthase. And the enzyme sea gas takes a molecule of uh, of A and a molecule of of G and makes a cyclic nucleotide out of it. And that in eukaryotic cells, sea gas is activated by DNA in the cytoplasm. So DNA is not supposed to be in the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells. It's supposed to be relegated either to the mitochondria or the nucleus. And so there are systems in place to sense when there's cytosolic DNA because one of the ideas is that it, maybe it's viral. So viral DNA bind, or DNA binds sea gas. It becomes activated. It then takes a, a GMP and an a GTP and an ATP and makes GMP AMP cyclic molecule, which and then that molecule binds a protein called Sting. It has nothing to do with the guy from the band Police, although it is a police protein. It's a good name. It's a police function. Yes, Sting Got stands it. for stimulator of interferon genes. I think the person who named it was thinking of police. You know. Yes. And so Sting then. Um, turns on interferon pathways, which then make responses against whatever virus is around to try and get into it. So it turns out that there are related systems in bacteria. There are sea gases, uh, which are antiphage signaling systems. And then the sea gases are linked with what are called cyclic dinucleotide-based antiphage signaling systems, or CBAS, C-B-A-S-S. And there are over 2,000 of them in bacteria that you can find just by looking at sequences, gene sequencing. And so you have sea gas, which synthesizes cyclic GAMP, CGAMP, and then uh, various effectors that are activated by CGAMP, which are the ones that destroy, they actually destroy the host so that the viral infection doesn't spread. It's a very, very um, <laughs> altruistic. altruistic behavior of the bacterium. You know, taking one for the team, so to speak. Well, that's how we look at it, you know, but it's, yes. a, it's a human view, which I'm not, I'm always comfortable with, but that's no. my, that's what we're looking at. So um, in these prokaryotic systems, there are two proteins called CAP2 and CAP3 uh, that are part of the defenses. CAP2 encodes an enzyme, which is called an E1 ubiquitin activating enzyme and an E2 ubiquitin carrier domain. Ubiquitins are small proteins that are often linked to uh, so another protein. It can be to signal it for degradation. In some cases, it can activate uh, the function of the protein. Uh, but none of these ubiquitin ligases in bacteria have been shown to have any role in defense against virus infection, even though these these signaling systems have this ubiquitin-like activity doesn't seem to be involved in defense. And so um, that's one of the uh, topics of the paper is what, what's going on here. And then among the effectors, so remember, the CGAMP activates other proteins which do the killing. There's one called CAPV, which is a phospholipase activated by CGAMP, just to give you an idea. So CGAMP is made by CGAS, and uh, what what it's detecting, we're not sure, uh, but probably DNA in, in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. We are sure it's activated by DNA. And then uh, CGAMP is made, and then CGAMP 
activates effector proteins, which are the ones that do the job. And, and CAV is an example. It's a phospholipase. It degrades the bacterial cell membrane. The bacteria then dies, and that prevents the phage from uh, propagating. But what's really important to think about is that bacterial DNA is normally in the cytoplasm. Yeah. So that's a conundrum because at least in eukaryotic viral attacks, the DNA is locked up in the nucleus. Here, because bacteria have no nuclei, the DNA, the chromosomal DNA is out there. But I think it's the supercoiling that actually protects the chromosomal DNA mm -hmm. as opposed to the phage DNA that when it comes in or even the RNA when it comes in, it makes the DNA and it effectively is not supercoiled at that point in time because it's being actively expressed. That seems like a dangerous game when you also have plasmids and things. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it really is. But the choice is you eliminate the entire population. Yeah. <laughs> Collective pressure is evil that way. You know, adapt or die. So this paper, it's a very uh, beautifully done paper. I'm just going to give you some summary of the key points. So the, the first thing they say, th this CAP2 protein, is it being attached to something else? And so... This whole operon, this C bass operon, they put it in a, a strain of E. coli that doesn't have it that doesn't have its own C bass, and they look for a cap two being attached to, to something, covalently linked to something, and it turns out it's attached to C gas. Nice, the enzyme, <laughs> which they do. They, you know, they do a variety of experiments to show that, uh, and they do immunoblotting and and so forth, and so C gas. The enzyme that makes CGAMP is being attached to CAP2, and it's the, the ubiquitin ligase-like like activity that's involved in that, it, but it's not ubiquitin. It's, it's something else. And an important finding, they take there's – there's a glycine at the very C terminus of uh, CAP2, of C gas. And if you take away that glycine, it no longer gets attached to CAP2, and that's a very important – finding, which we're going to come to uh, just in a moment. All right. So in addition, interestingly, remember I said there's CAP2 and CAP3, which are part of this operon. CAP3 turns out to be an enzyme that removes C gas from whatever it's attached to. So it's kind of reversing or turning off the system. It's a regulator of some kind. All right. So is this widespread? They look in Vibrio cholera, they look in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, they looked in Enterobacter cloaceae. They all have these uh, systems with, uh, which, in which uh, C gas is conjugated to CAP2. So, you know, the, those, those three bacteria have it as well. All right, so the role of this system is to reduce phage infection. So they ask, um, is, is conjugation by C gas important for the antiviral effect of CAP2 because CAP2 is the effector and they put, they make changes in the amino acid sequence that will block the conjugation and then they, they infect with phages and uh, they see what happens. And so um, if you change the, the catalytic site residue of, of CAP2 and then you infect with T4, T6 and Lambda, you get more virus. You get, uh, Two, more than two orders of magnitude increase, but no effect on P1, T2, and T5. Interesting. So it's very specific. Mm. Um, and if you delete that C-terminal glycine uh, on, on C gas, which I told you was essential for the conjugation, again, the phages go crazy. They reproduce to much higher titers. It's the same as inactivating CAP2 by changing the... Uh, active site residues. So that must have been a very satisfying day in the lab. I'm sure. Yeah. Cause it's, it's called a phenocopy. You get the same phenotype, but two different genetic, genetic changes in two different genes. So it's, it's saying that, um, these, you're these, not hallucinating, <laughs> not hallucinating. So you're beginning to get some insight. Beginning conjugating, to get some insight. uh, through sea gas is important for the antiphage immune defense. Uh, next question, does C gas, so, so when C gas gets conjugated 
to CAP2, you get more CGAMP production. It stimulates the production of CGAMP. So they actually measure that by measuring CGAMP production in the cell. And so putting um, CGAS onto CAP2 increases the production of CGAMP. So that may be one reason why uh, that is happening there. It's also, remember, it's also... Cap Cap two is also conjugated to other things, and and that's what they try and understand next. So what's why is this conjugation uh, needed? So they say let's find some some conjugation targets in phages that could provide some insight into this. And so they said, okay, if the phage has a target that's conjugated uh, by C gas, we should be able to find mutants that will grow in the presence of this system. And maybe the phage encodes an inhibitor that's antagonized by conjugation. Uh, we could find mutants that are sensitive uh, uh, to, to this whole system that's defective in conjugation. So they mutagenized the phage and they, they looked for variants. They have not found a target, a, a CGAS conjugation target in phages yet, but they have found a protein encoded in the phage genome, the T4 genome. It's called VS.4 protein of previously unknown function that appears to antagonize this CBAS system. Hmm. And so, right? So what do they do? They solve the crystal structure. The, the idea is that it binds CGAMP. So they're saying VS.4 is binding CGAMP so it cannot um, do whatever its thing is, right? Mm -hmm. So they solve the crystal structure of VS.4 together with uh, CGAMP and VS.4 uh, binds three CGAMP molecules. So it's, it's sequestering uh, CGAMP and um, it, it's short, short circuiting, short circuiting the defense. Yeah. Pathway then. yeah. And uh, you know, so cap V requires CGAMP for its activation as a phospholipase. lipase. So uh, this protein VS.4 will bind CGAMP, it's sequestered away from, so CAP V can't get activated. The, the phospholipase is not activated and the, and the bacteria doesn't die. So it's a phage counter defense against um, this, this CGAMP uh, system. So that's the overall story. Basically, C gas is conjugated, we saw to CAP2 and probably also to other molecules via this C terminal glycine. And they think, and, and then this, um, leads to activation of effectors, uh, CAP-V, of which is one. And uh, they think that this conjugation system evolved during the arms race between bacteria and phages. So there are phages that arose that can antagonize C gas signaling. And so this conjugation uh, system arose, and they said VS.4 is an example of such an arms race. It binds C gamp with high affinity. It sequesters it and enables the phage to infect uh, bacteria that don't produce enough CGAMP. So in other words, the phage protein can sop up. And so bacteria evolved a counter defense that conjugates CAP2 to CGAS and it enhances CGAMP production, right? So they think that this conjugating of CGAMP to, to uh, um, CAP2, which ends up making more CGAS, is a way of countering the sequestration of... Uh, CGAMP uh, by VS.4. So that, that's what they think. We, you can't hard to prove that, right? But it makes a lot of sense on an evolutionary basis. And then CAP3 can reverse. So if you're making too much uh, CGAMP, you can reverse this conjugation and turn it down as well. And they said, we, we got to do more experiments to figure that out. But that's the basic story. And I think it's cool for me because I like the CGAMP, CGAS, system in, in eukaryotes. It's very cool. It makes a lot of sense and to find it in uh, bacteria as well with, with mechanistic differences, right? Uh, there's no interferons here. There's something else that's going on, but it's still very cool. And so it's ancient, obviously. There you go. Yeah, no, it's super cool. And I really do like the connection because, you know, even if the outcome isn't the same, the signal is conserved between the eukaryotic DNA viruses and the yeah. prokaryotic ones. And then I also like this arms race. So this is just another thing in the list of many ways bacteria are fighting phage. And then you find the phage fighting yeah. back. It's, it's, I love this. It's like, it gets more and more elaborate every time. 
Red Queen. <laughs> it is. They're all going the, all the running in place and nobody gets anywhere, right? Well, everybody survives, I guess. <laughs> survives <Just> well <laughs> enough. <laughs> it becomes sufficiently uh complex that you need an interdisciplinary team to mm. sort this out, applying both, you know, classical biochemistry and quanti- or, um, analytical biochemistry and also molecular genetics uh, yeah. to think about all this and plus understand the biology, infection biology. So the, the um, project in the Chen lab was led by postdoc Justin Jensen, and he got his start to science studying biomedical engineering at the University of Utah. And as a freshman, he started working in Susan Bach's lab studying protein engineering and really became hooked on the environment. He got to work on, contribute to a variety of projects, some like vaccine development, protein isoform evolution, et cetera. And it quickly became clear to him that if he wanted to really make a contribution to medicine and by engineering proteins, he'd have to understand both chemistry and biology. So he decided to get a second major um, in chemistry while he was there at Utah, and then he was motivated to enroll in graduate school, Um, and for that he went to MIT, their biology program, and he studied protein engineering with Amy Keaton's lab, and he focused on protein design pipelines to create protein binders that are more efficient um, against a wider variety of of targets. So after that training, he then uh, was delighted to join um, Dr. Chen's lab, who he goes by James, by the way, at UT Southwestern um, with this project. But he started out studying some um, eukaryotic DNA sensors in vertebrates. Um, but then when he discovered this um, sea gas conjugation in bacteria, he was like so surprised and really excited, dropped his other projects and really focused on this. And he was so grateful to um, James Chen, who was a strong advocate right from the start of him pursuing this new uh, line of research and um, really supported him in doing that. He also wants to give a shout out to um, postdoc Dr. Lee, who was a great collaborator who did the really challenging mass spec experiments that allowed them to identify the different components in the gamish of bacterial proteins, <laughs> and also gave them just a lot of insights that helped shape the story. And then research scientists um, do performed many of the assays and did a lot of the cloning and really um, kept the project moving along at a good pace. And then um, Chi Kui Yi is an instructor who also contributed both experimentally and intellectually um, and was able to get a number of the assays going that um, Justin himself was struggling with and also contributed a lot of ideas. So it sounds like a great place to work. And of course, they're led by um, James Chen. He's a Howard Hughes investigator, also a distinguished chair in biomedical science and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So what a, what a wonderful place to work. And um, Justin points out that he his input was essential in shaping the project, helping writing the story in, a, in an impactful way, and also promoting the project and, and getting it high visibility. So hats off to this team. It's a really beautiful science. And we're going to learn a little bit more about it from the next paper, aren't we? We are indeed, Michelle, and thank you. So On TWIM today, we're exploring how populations of bacteria address the issue of infections by phage, and then how phages have adapted themselves in order to address the age-old problem of adapt or die. So we're going to continue where Vincent left off. In a few moments, you'll hopefully appreciate why. Rather than explore the primary literature, as is our usual form, we're going to feature a title that is in the category of a spotlight paper that's found in the journal Trends in Microbiology. The title of this offering that actually features uh, a review of the discussion of the paper that we just completed with Vincent and another paper that appeared in Cell that is like all manuscripts in Cell, very detailed and very elaborate, But this spotlight paper entitled Viral Sponges Sequester Nucleotide Signals to Inactivate Immunity. And unfortunately, this this short paper is behind a paywall. But if your institution has a subscription to the cell family of journals, then you're in. 
But you can also see the original paper by Wu Tang uh, in Cell itself because it's open access. But I thought we'd do this spotlight paper to help put it into perspective. And this is really a great paper because it condenses a lot of complicated data into a digestible two-page article. And it's by Desmond Richmond Bucola and Phil Krasnins, uh, who are at the Harvard Medical School and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So here the story picks up by introducing us to the fact that viruses need to overcome what their host throws at them as a roadblock in the host's defense paradigm to ensure a productive and complete infection doesn't take place. In the case of viruses that infect bacteria or these phages, the inhibition or do I, you know, quote the authors here and say immunity is mediated by these cyclic oligonucleotide-based antiviral systems that Vincent introduced us to that are abbreviated CBAS. Now, the synthesis by the host of these special cyclic nucleotides restrict phage amplification through the activation of an abortive infection mechanism. So the individual bacterium that's been infected by the phage appreciates the infection and then actually ends its own existence as through the mechanism that Vincent just went through. So in today's offering, what Bucola and Krasbush have unpacked are these two papers, and they both have recently appeared in the literature, one in Cell, one in Nature, and they offer to show us or illustrate for us how this process works and then how the phage has worked itself out of this physiological slash genetic bottleneck of being unable to produce a productive infection. In the studies where the structural and functional analysis of CBAS operons were conducted, now in the cell paper, they offer us insight into these cyclic nucleotide signaling systems, and they have this evolutionary connection to the cyclic GMP, AMP synthase simulator or interferon genes. And recall that interferons are this class of antiviral molecules that are a group of signaling proteins and are released by host cells in response to the presence of viruses. In a typical scenario, a virus-infected cell will release interferons, causing nearby cells to heighten their antiviral defense system. So what this offers is the bacteria have had this nucleotide second messenger signaling likely the longer than our own eukaryotic cells. And the fundamental question that we can never answer is why, but I think we know how. It's simply because it's to keep these phage infections in check so that it doesn't wipe out the entire population. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense in these very complex microbial communities where phage can eliminate a player in the microbiome, which would be pretty deleterious to the host that the bacterial community is is living in. Now, the intent of alerting you to the spotlight offering is to help us all unpack the central question of how viruses have evolved to inactivate the CBAS signaling system thereby evading the consequence, namely an abortive infection. So the viruses are responding to the host. So what Bucola and Krasnus have elegantly done in their spotlight is to condense how phage have developed an immune evasion protein that serves to sequester the cyclic oligonucleotide-based antiphage nucleotide signaling molecules. So here's the proposed mechanism. Viral infection is sensed by the host leading to the production of this enzyme expression system that Vincent went through. 
you might be asking, why is there such a system? Well, these um, cyclic dinucleotide NTase enzymes function as nucleic acid and chemical sensors, allowing both bacterial and viral cells to respond to changing environmental circumstances. Recalling from our cell biology days, cyclic GMP and AMP synthase is a signaling enzyme in human cells that controls immune sensing of the cytosolic DNA. And here, this is the antiphage system, the enzyme activation of this C gas uh, nucleotide transferase enzyme activation and the synthesis thereby of these cyclic or trinucleotide second messenger signaling molecules. Now, production of the second messenger then facilitates a rapid amplification of the antiviral signaling and activation of these diverse downstream uh, protein effectors that are, uh, in the case of Wheatine's paper, abbreviated CAP, that then triggers cell death of the bacterial host, resulting in the halting of phage replication. When I did, what I did when I was unpacking this in my, my mind, I thought of these proteins that they abbreviated CAP as a, they abbreviated as CAP as a selfless act by the individual bacterium for the greater good of the host population, if you will, the host is falling on the grenade to prevent the population from succumbing to the, the rapid amplica- amplification of phage because in bacteria, phage burst size is typically in, you know, between the hundreds to thousands of phage particles per individual bacterium. But wait, haven't the phage literally had eons to develop, to develop their own workarounds? And As my brother would often say, you betcha, and as Vincent's already offered in the snippet, Jensen and his colleagues, and also in the cell paper by Wooten, each devised a genetic trick or selection scheme to identify mutant phages. And since Vincent's already described the first, I'm going to focus on the second. And what Wooten did is they identified mutant phages that are sensitive or resistant to the ZBAS system. And they looked at first over 300 CBAS operons encoded by Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates. And then they engineered, based on the sequence comparison, as you do when you look at 300 base, you know, 300 different operons, they engineered four deletion strains that then enabled them to screen using a diverse panel of phages for their different responses to C-BAS-dependent phenotypes. I love these sort of genetic selection approaches. And in the case of Wu-Tang, they isolated a spontaneous mutant from the phage of Pseudomonas PAMX41 as a gain-of-function mutation in that its phage ORF24 gene enabled the phage to challenge successfully a CBAS defensive system of the host. And the phenotype they simply look for is, can you make plaques? You know, it's, a, it's you know, did you overcome the CBAS system? And so it's a pretty straightforward and easy selection to imagine while listening to us. They simply looked for a hole in the auger. Now, the contrast of Wu-Tang's approach over the paper we just snipped is we have direct analysis of of CBAS in its native or endogenous context and evidence that overexpression of the CBAS operon was not the way the phages overcame it because it wasn't required for the anti-phage defense uh, phenotype that they saw. Remarkably, These two distinct papers and their respective independent genetic approaches revealed that in the case of ORF24 and Chen VS4, that different phages encode homologous protein products that facilitated the workaround 
to the Sebasism. I dare not say resistance as my clinical colleagues are going to think we're going to do a Kirby Bauer test, but we're not. We're, we're effectively doing a plaque. But that is which, so cool that the, the two yes. different labs studying t- using two different approaches land on the same function. And, and the purpose of the spotlight is they brought together in real time. I mean, this paper is published relatively, the spotlight paper is published relatively recently. And the nature paper was published a few months ago and the cell paper was published in February. So this rapidly made it into press. So what these two papers have shown is we now appreciate a new protein family dedicated to combating the signaling transmitted by these cyclic nucleotides or simply CBAS avoidance. Now, this observation slapped me upside my head and forced me to wonder if such systems exist in the eukaryotic version of viruses. Vincent, this is the question to you. Do you know if uh, viruses have evolved the equivalent of these sorts of systems or if folks haven't looked? Oh, yeah, they're there. They're there. uh, Every every stage of interferon sensing and induction, there are antagonists. And uh, there's one for this too. Yep. So as Michelle pointed out in the overview of the offers uh, from the Nature paper, both both authors evaluated uh, the systems using biochemistry and structural a- evaluations to propose how and classical n- classical genetics. They each oh yes, did, classical you know, classical genetic screens, which I love. Yes, in in the Wu Tang paper, they named this this protein ACB two, which enables phages from Pseudomonas and Escherichia to overcome CBAS immunity. And you're probably saying, well, what's ACB1? Well, that's another protein that can overcome phage infection that we'll get to as we move further on. I mean, the nomenclature will drive you to a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> well, and but, I, like, I like the way they simplify this and give you a, a conceptual. Um, yes, there's a great I cartoon. Call it a sponge. Yes. A yep. viral sponge. And that's in a really neat experiment, Wu Tang was able to show that ACB2, this is the protein that the phage are making, depletes the three, three cyclic GAMP from solution and prevents the cap effector activation by binding directly to the cyclic nucleotide. Now, hold on, with nanomolar efficiency or affinity. Placing this into perspective, that consider that most antibodies, their KD values or their dissociation constants are in the low micromolar range, 10 to the minus 6, to the nanomolar, 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 9 range. Now, again, relating this back to human antibodies, high affinity antibodies are generally considered to be in the low nanomolar 10 to the minus nine affinity ranges with very high affinity antibodies being in the picomolar range. So if you will, the phage has made a molecule with an equivalency to an human antibody. It's literally binding a protein akin and it's having the same, if you will, phenotype preventing an infection from uh, progressing. Again, this was a say what moment for me. Up till these two papers, the only known explanation of CBAS escape required the synthesis of a phage-encoded nuclease appropriately named ACB1. And as you can imagine, a nuclease would eat the cyclic nucleotides which has been so shown to degrade the host nucleotide signals. But Michael, given this really high affinity, do you think instead of sponge, it's more like a Velcro? Yeah, I, I do indeed. <laughs> I, I do indeed because Velcro, you can, if you put enough force, you can pull it off, you know, enough driving force. And that's effectively the relationship between repressors binding to DNA 
and versus once the repressor concentration drops. So yeah, it, it really is a, I think Velcro, but sponge is really e- easy to wrap your, yeah, your head around. It applies sopping up. So sopping and up. Plus they show that, um, these sponges can um, soak up not one specific structure, but actually a number of things in that family. Whereas Velcro, you think it's got to have a very specific part to bind to. So I think sponge is a better, a better Swiffer, term. Maybe is a good one. Swiffer, Swiffer, because you got to stop the <laughs> infection because the unlike eukaryotic viruses, which can take up to 10 20 hours to replicate, phage do it all in 40 minutes that, you know, start to finish. Now, Perhaps the proof that this ACB2 protein was serving as a molecular sponge was when they simply added a protease to the tube. And upon addition of the enzyme, they were able to degrade the protein sponge, but the cyclic nucleotide molecule was then released back because it was untouched by the proteinases. And then the cyclic nucleotide simply restored the activation of the cap effector function. So no more phage, so sad, too bad. Uh, I mean, you, 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 if you knock out the phage contribution, the phage uh, cannot do a productive infection. So bottom lining this, the CBAS inhibition occurs through nucleotides signal sequestration not a modification or a degradation of CBAS. It's, as, as Petra said, it, it's really a sponge. So the phage have somehow managed to acquire a molecule with an equivalency to a pretty good antibody. A- and then as you do now, I guess, both groups then determine high-resolution crystal structures of this ACB2 molecule uh, cyclic uh, GAMP molecule to define the molecular mechanisms of the cyclic nucleotide binding. And their analysis confirmed that the structures of ACB2 revealed a homo heteromeric assembly with six promo- protomers that interlock to create a triangular complex that it really, in my mind's eye, as I was reading that, looks like that common kitchen sponge that you have to soak up water. So head-to-head ACP2 promoter interactions at each vertex of the triangular complex form distinct binding pockets, allowing the, the ACP2 hexamere to, again, it's imagining it as a molecular sponge scarfing up the three molecules of these cyclic nucleotides at nanomolar efficiencies. And recall that the work in the Wu-Tang paper, they selected for CBAS-resistant pseudomonas uh, phage phenotypes and identified escapers. So they next asked where the escape was coming from. And a wild guess that many of you probably have tumbled to was in the capsid proteins. Again, the authors pointed out, and I concur, that by virtue of the fact that the escape mutations had defects in capsid, we might then have a path forward in developing an understanding of the initial steps of phage recognition during the activation of the CBAS anti-phage defense system. And again, I always want to remind folks that bacteria are really fast at what they do and phage are even faster. And so this is a population effect and that in the bacterial world, no population is ever truly synchronized. So how can the production of a viral sponge by one host help the population give programmed phage expression what it needs to do? And But what this work does offer is the sponges are, dare I say, the phago bodies can do indeed sequester the single signaling molecules of the host. If these two papers and now this spotlight help to us wrestle with these two discrete observations from two great papers that caps at escape mutations in concert with these um, targeting conjugation type activities that gives us an idea of where to look next as a possible source of 
the activation cues during a viral infection cycle that it may explain the open question of how CBAS immune nucleotide signaling is initially activated in infected cells. So here's the question for the audience. So before today, how many of us would have said phage could produce a molecule during its infection with an equivalency in both function and affinity to a human antibody, but yet with an opposite effect. Uh, and, you know, the thing I appreciate is the microbial world never ceases to amaze. What do you mean by the opposite effect? Exactly. I think for the phage, it's exactly the same effect. It's the same. It's a blocking of the... Uh, it, yeah. For the bacteria, it's the opposite effect. But the, it's yeah. the, for the, the bacteria. The producing it, the phage, yeah. so basically. My, in my glee, I should have <laughs> Yeah. So the, fa- the antibodies are blocking the activity of the ligand, yeah. whatever it may be. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I'm just counting systems now because there's this one, there's CRISPR, there's... Uh-huh. Um, Obviously, restriction modification. Mm-hmm. Enzymes. And then there's also toxin antitoxin has been implicated. Oh. Are we at four? Oh, five? so I had my guest on TWIV in, in Quebec a couple of weeks ago. He was a marine biologist, Jed Furman. I said, How many? So we're talking about marine phages and bacteria. Yes. I said, How many different defense systems? He said, Hundreds. <laughs> wow. And and that's what that's what actually clued me in. I I listened to that twiv, and I listened to his comment. And so as I was skimming the titles looking for a paper for this week's twiv twim, I, I said, "Well, this this looks right up our alley," and it it really was a very cool way of getting three papers into two. Yeah, that was a very interesting discussion. He uh, he was illuminating for sure. Let me see if I can find that. That was. 12 was it 12 or 13? it was 13 it 13. was 13 i think yeah daniel has all the even numbers these days i don't know why yes because uh, no, tw- you're only 13. doing two you're only doing two a week now oh, only only, only two a week <laughs> only two a week <laughs> we do one every other week yeah he um crispr oh yeah this is this is what i wanted to tell you crispr defenses are not common in marine bacteria which is interesting because they're, what is it? Half of uh, bacterial species have CRISPR defenses or maybe. Yes. So that's an interesting line because it's just like, it's just habitat. It has nothing to do with. Yeah, I know. With, but he said it could be that we just haven't found them, right? We haven't I, looked. I, so I that doesn't have the canonical CRISPR sequences. And so I, then I said, well, so what other defenses are present? And he said, ah, oh, hundreds. <laughs> I don't know if they're hundreds, but I mean, you've named four just now and they're well actually there's three restriction systems type one type two and type three but he did say that there are lots of nucleotide based systems and that's exactly what we talked about today yeah right right right. so i asked him a question if you took all the viruses out of the oceans if you could do that what would happen and he said the system would readjust to make, the, Jeff Gold, the Jeff Goldblum <laughs> quote from Jurassic Park. What is, what is his quote again? Remind me. Yes, that's a good uh, one. Um, bio, biology always finds no, a way. No, it's life finds a way. Life, yeah, finds, life a way. finds a way. So, so, Vincent, when you say the system would readjust, what, what are you, system is capturing <laughs> So, what? basically, the phages are keeping the bacterial populations in check. He's, otherwise, the oceans would be cloudy with bacteria. Right, right. right? So they're keeping them in check. So if you took the viruses out, something else would would move in to keep the bacteria in check. Yeah. Mm. And then another guy, Curtis Suttle, got up and said, I disagree. I think life would cease on Earth. <laughs> well, Cur- well Curtis Curtis Suttle what kind of life? That's all we're all talking about. Curtis all Suttle life. is the marine <laughs> no viral guru. Yeah, he's, he thinks they're very important. But he thinks that, you know, if you, if you take away the microbiome from everything, you would, life would cease. Someone said in two weeks, life would cease if you took away all the bacteria on Earth, right? Yeah. So Curtis said, if you want me to say the same would happen taking away viruses, I'm happy to say that. But but Jed, Jud, uh, Jed was more uh, sanguine about it. <laughs> anyway, so life, there was uh, – go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Life would not be worth living. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Without the microbes. <laughs> but but here's the thing that's very interesting. So 
I said, Jed, why did people look for viruses in the ocean? He said, well, because the turnover, the turnover of protists didn't make any sense. There was more turnover than you would expect just by predation. Mm. And so they looked for, and they found viruses that were responsible for the, the rest, which is right, really right. a great answer. So I wanted to give you an example of an antagonist in a eukaryotic system because you asked me before, Michael. Uh, and in fact, this is a paper that was just published last year and Phil Kranzusch is a, an author on it. And uh, varicella zoster virus, which is the, causes chickenpox and shingles, it is sen- its DNA is sensed by the C-gas, C-gamp pathway. C gas sting pathway. So sting is not present in bacteria because sting is a st- stimulator of interferon, but C gas and C gamp are present. And when varicella zoster virus infects the cell, the pathway is activated. So the virus encodes an antagonist. It's, it's called orphanine. And it's within the capsid of the, of the virus. So when the virus enter, puts its DNA in the cell, the inhibitor goes along with it. So it's ready to inhibit interferon <laughs> production, right? So that's a great example of an antagonist. You have to antagonize. It's brilliant. Otherwise, viruses do not exist unless they antagonize. Yeah. yeah. And I dropped into the show notes, uh, Krasnus wrote a review article um, structure, mechanism, and evolution and, uh, on this concept. And it's it's um, in the show notes for your right. review. With some terrifically clear diagrams mm-hmm. to help organize these terms and the flow. All right. Thank you, Michael. I have two emails I would like to read before we finish. The first is from Jose who writes, I'm writing to express my gratitude for your efforts in highlighting our paper on the theft of phage tails by certain satellites to facilitate their spread in nature. Your support and enthusiasm for our work mean a lot to me and my team. Thank you for taking time to acknowledge your research, for helping to disseminate its findings to a wider audience. We hope our work will contribute to a better understanding of the complex mechanisms involved in the spread of viruses in the environment. And Jose Peñades He's a professor of microbiology at Imperial College London. And we did that paper a couple of twibs ago, right, Michael? Mm-hmm. Yep. It was uh, it was you and me on the show. Let's it see. was just us. Um, let's find the number. Twim. Twim. 285 or 284. It wasn't 286. That was – wasn't two, so it must have been 285 or 284. Okay, it's not on the front page there. All right, thank you. Our pleasure, Jose. All right, here's a question for you folk. This is from Asher. I picked up TWIM when I took microbiology for my AS in marine science and have been listening off and on through my BA in biology and now more regularly again as a medical laboratory technician. I've been working the scope quite a bit every day (laughs) and I've seen all manner of common critters on my gram stains. But something has started to bug me. Good choice of a word, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Most cluster cluster in ways you would expect. Long chains like sausages, palisades, or grape-like clusters. There you go. There's the grape-like cluster. Regardless of the direction of division strategy, it doesn't seem that it's carefully planned except for when it does. Some bacteria, no matter how numerous overall, only seem to appear in tight pairings. Strep pneumoniae, strep B, I'm thinking of in particular. Strep pneumo being especially interesting since there is a capsule around it. And inside, I have not yet seen multiples greater than two. Why is this? Is there some advantage to keeping in pairs? Are they compartmentalizing their biochem to produce different metabolisms? Sort of a two, a two called a so-called multicellular organism or do they just break apart easily and reproduce rapidly so it only looks like there are always two having always just recently divided i've tried searching google for answers but haven't found any do you know offhand thanks so much for your fantastic show and asher is up in maine okay I can point him to some of Arthur Koch's writings <laughs> on this subject. Arthur was very much into how and why cells divide the way they do. And I don't have a reasonably concise explanation as to why. I, it was always taught to me about the planes that the the planes of FTSZ and how it's splitting the cell in half. 
And that's what determines and where FTSZ binds. And I think it's probably a variation on. I think the- Petra is dying to answer the question. <laughs> All right, please, Petra. I love Arthur, but um, my guess <laughs> is, and I actually haven't thought about the diplococci, so that's what those are. So, like, bes- uh, you know, a lot of bacteria chain, um, I think, uh, strep A chains. I think it probably has to do with the regulation of these enzymes that clip the glycan strands called, called autolysins. And I don't know why diplococci are favored. I don't think it has anything to do directly with having capsule because lots of bacteria have capsule and like Klebsiella E. coli can, um, you know, this is common. Um, but I think it's probably the order of activation of these um, autolysins and maybe for some reason they're held inactive. Mm. Um, longer until the next round of division starts and then they're released in some way. They happen to recognize what's called denuded glycans, you know, when the peptide steps have been cleaved off. So I'm guessing it's something in there, but why there's an advantage that's, you know, the classic biology question, why is always the hardest to answer. So I'm guessing there's some cool regulation in there, but I don't, I couldn't find anything either. All right. I could imagine that cells that form more um, networks could bind to their substrate more avidly than a pair. So it could have something to do with whether mm-hmm. they want to stick or spread. Right. But I don't understand why pair versus signal. That's the right. Right. Yeah. Right. No, staff clearly likes those clusters and I have a feeling that has to do with how, you know, it mm-hmm. like surfaces a lot, but I don't know yep. in the case of these guys. All right. That is the end of TWIM 289. That was good timing. We're going to do 290 at uh, ASM Micro. Yep. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIM. You can send your questions and comments. Just send them. We'd love your questions. TWIM at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, we would love your support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Petra Levins at Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, guys. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.